असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this retreat on non-duality. The spiritual problem. is that is it possible to overcome suffering is it possible to find permanent and profound meaning in life is it possible to find lasting joy and happiness in life is transcendence of our empirical life possible and spiritual all spiritual paths they insist that yes it is that is the promise of spirituality it is possible to overcome death it is possible to overcome suffering it is possible to find the deepest and most profound meaning and lasting joy in life the greatest promise that human civilization has now broadly speaking in the path of spirituality there are different paths in spirituality there are different paths different paths depending on how you how you situate the problem one way is the path of knowledge advaita vedanta non dual vedanta which we shall be doing today which we shall take that's the path we shall follow today where the idea is that the ultimate reality is present right now right here and all that prevents us from realizing it is our ignorance we don't notice it it's as simple as that we don't see it we don't get it there's really nothing to be done except remove ignorance and ignorance can be removed by knowledge any ignorance can be removed by knowledge so the path of non dual vedanta path of non dual vedanta is a path of knowledge the problem is situated as a problem of ignorance and the solution is knowledge the darkness of ignorance has to be removed by the light of knowledge that's one way and that's the way we will be taking today but just for contrast just for understanding there are other ways too there is the path of yoga of meditation which says ignorance is not really the problem the primary problem is the restlessness of the mind if the mind can be calmed through meditation can be focused the scattered powers of the mind can be concentrated through meditation then the truth will reveal itself so that's the path of yoga where the problem is seen as a problem of restlessness of mind and the solution is seen as concentration or focus of mind or calming down the mind and the technique will be meditation that's one path a different path the first one was one of knowledge the second one is one of meditation there is yet another path the most well known of all in all the conventional religions of the world the path of bhakti the path of devotion the path of faith where you say that the problem is not one of ignorance the problem is not one of restlessness of mind the problem is one of lack of faith in god belief in god and surrender to god so that's the path of devotion that's the path of love and surrender and faith in god which is uh, more or less the broad highway in most religions but today we shall concentrate on the first one the whole day will be dedicated to the first path ignorance is the problem knowledge is the solution what ignorance and what knowledge according to advaita vedanta the central truth is very simple she just sang it that in the cave of my heart atman and brahman shall never part the ultimate reality is you your inner self is the ultimate reality brahman whatever you call it brahman atman the absolute god uh, the void whatever you call it that ultimate reality there is such an ultimate reality and it's you we do not know it that's the only problem and advaita vedanta the path of non dual vedanta seeks to point it out to us how does it work 
it says if that's the only reality, according to the Vedanta, the only reality is this Brahman, an absolute existence, consciousness, bliss. These may sound like big words, but at the end of the day, they'll just be facts to you. Uh, at least in understanding, if not in enlightenment. <laughs> we'll see that. If that's the only reality, the world is an appearance, then in that case, where is that reality? Vedanta says it's everywhere. If it's everywhere, it must be here, right here. When do you find that reality? After death, when you are promised to heaven? No. If it is eternal, it must be for all time. If it is for all time, it must be now. And if it's the only reality, then what? It is the reality of every object, everything, everyone that you see. The reality of that must be this ultimate Brahman, the, the Absolute. What I'm trying to say is, according to Advaita Vedanta, the non-dual Vedanta, the tremendous claim is this. That ultimate reality which we are searching for, the goal of all spirituality, is available right here, right now, and in everything that we experience. Now the question comes, if that's so, then the big question will be, why don't I know it? Why don't I experience it? At least in conventional religion, when I am told that just believe in what the good book says, in the Gita or, or the, the, the Quran or the Bible, what it says, just believe and after death you will be rewarded and you will go to this place called heaven. Now heaven is a place different from this place. If you say, why can't I see God? Why can't I uh, experience heaven? You will be told, oh, God is in heaven. That's why you can't see God. God's not here. So it's, an, it's nice. I mean, there's no problem. You, you can't dispute that. Only thing is, after death, if I don't find God, I can't come back and catch the, the, the teacher. <laughs> it's too late. But if you claim that ultimate reality which you are speaking of is right here, then I have a legitimate question. Why don't I experience it? If it is right now, if you say the spiritual reality called God is a posthumous experience, after death you get to see God. In that case, you are safe. Because nobody can catch you right now. Because if you ask, where is God? You'll say, you wait. Lead a good life. Do be a, a good boy or good girl. And after death, you get to see God. But if you say it's right now, then I can legitimately ask, why can't I see it now? Why can't I experience it now? Advaita Vedanta takes on this question head on and says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. The literature of Vedanta, the Upanishads, are full of what I might call pointers. Pointing to this ultimate reality here and now and within you. Right now. We will take up today three of these pointers. Today's uh, retreat has been structured, a very simple structure. Three of these insights, I can call them insights or pointers. Or each of these insights points to the same thing. But the, the advantage of multiple approaches is, if one doesn't work for you, the other will. If one works for you, you can enjoy this one and the other one also. And the third one also. So three. We have three of these insights which I'll share with all of you today and uh, the structure is this there are three sessions each session built around one of these insights all of the insights will tell you just the same thing that there is this ultimate reality and it's Brahman and this is how you experience it right now right here so three sessions one starting now which we will conclude at 1115 the next one will be at 11.30, which we will conclude at 12.45. And then, yes, there is lunch. So <laughs> you can have your lunch. Um, and then we come back for the third session, which is at 1.45. So 12.45 to 1.45 is lunch. And 1.45 to 3, because we have to wrap up by 3 o'clock. So 1.45 to 3 is the third session, which has the third insight. So three insights, so three pointers to the ultimate reality which you are, according to Advaita Vedanta. Each of these sessions is divided into three parts. Traditionally, in Advaita Vedanta, the way of teaching was this. First, there would be the teaching. The knowledge would be transferred. That phase is called listening, literally. Shravanam in Sanskrit. Listening, literally listening. The second part of the, of the session will be, each session, the second part will be 
thinking in Sanskrit, mananam. What you have heard, now think about it. And the third part will be the nididhyasana, which means meditation in Sanskrit. Meditating on what? What you have heard about, what you have thought through, that you must abide in. Meditation is abiding in what you have already got. You must stay there. So that will be the meditation part of it. So I'll divide each session into three parts. The first session, the first part of each session, which is going to start now, the first session, uh, you just listen carefully. The first part will be, I'll say something to you. Just listen carefully. You don't even have to see me. There are people who are sitting outside. I hear the voice quality there is excellent. So you can just sit outside and listen to my voice. But listen. Look out into the mist or the sea and listen. The second session will be what I have heard. The, the, the goal of the first, the first part, in the first session, the first part, the goal will be what did he say? That's all. What did he say? You don't have to literally repeat what I said to you. Just the gist of it. The essence of it. The second part of, the, of each session will be, okay, he said this, do I get it? There's a difference between being able to repeat what the teacher said and getting what the teacher said. So do I get it? If I do not get it, what are my questions? Where am I getting stuck? There I will work with you. Somebody will be there with a microphone and go around. Please ask questions. I will work with you. When the questions are being asked, listen, it's not just his or her question. Often it is a question common to everybody. Listen to the answer too. Often the answer works for somebody who's listening and may not, be work, may not work for the person who asked the question. So listen to the answers. That's the second part of each session. Thinking. In Sanskrit, mananam. It's essential because that's where you begin to get it. A kind of conviction comes up. Yeah, it's true. It could well be. Clarity comes. And then the third part, abiding in what you have understood. What you have heard, what you have understood. In the first session, the problem will be, I, I've heard what you said, but here are my problems, I don't get it. The second session, I have heard what you said, now my problems are clarified, I need to stay with it. So third session is staying with it. Not third session, sorry, third part of each session is staying with it. So three sessions, each session divided into three parts. First session, first part. The pointer or the insight which I will share with you now is drawn from a medieval book, a text called Panchadashi. So this is a truly Indian Himalayan edition. This is something that the Swamis carry around there, not in their pockets because they don't have pockets, <laughs> but they have little bundles. So books will be like this. It has the original verses in Sanskrit and a commentary in Sanskrit. This book is called Panchadashi. A beautiful English translation exists, translated by none other than our own Swami Swahananda. I am going to use the first chapter. In the first chapter, from verses 3 to 10, the author, Vidyaranya, who lived 700 years ago in the south of India, he, there's a remarkable performance in which, in eight verses, this author establishes that you are pure existence, pure consciousness, pure bliss. He establishes, without any appeal to authority, without any appeal to the Upanishads, just based on your experience and reason. Just based on experience and reason. What experience? The experience we all have and we all share. That experience and reason. And he shows that you are pure consciousness, pure existence and pure bliss. So it's quite remarkable in that performance. Now I'm not going to use all eight verses. I'm just going to use the first four verses which try to show that our real nature is pure consciousness. What is pure consciousness and how are we pure consciousness? It will become clear. So I'm going to use only four verses and they are going to point to that our real nature is pure consciousness. All right. I'll chant the Sanskrit just for effect. You don't have to know any Sanskrit. Uh, English is enough, but just for the sound of it. So please settle down. The first, this is verse number three from the first chapter. Shabda sparshadayo vedya vaichitrya jagare prithak tato vibhakta tat samvid 
ಐಕರೂಪ್ಯಾನ್ನ ಭಿದ್ಯತೆ what did it say i'll give you a literal translation first and then we'll go into the verse all our experiences all our experiences sound sight whatever we experience in life they're all different from each other and they keep changing but apart from them and unchanging is the awareness the consciousness to which these experiences av- uh, appear in which all these are experienced simple pointer but let's see what it means this verse is essential attend to this verse this is the key to the first session our life is made up of experiences that's what our life is think about it all the people that you have seen in your life all the things that you have heard all the things that you have seen or tasted or smelt or touched all that you have thought about all that you have remembered all that you have suffered all that you have enjoyed whatever you hoped for your desires your frustrations your personal uh, memories the loss of memories youth and old age and decay and disease and all of that they are all basically experiences is that true you're with me our life is a series of experiences just imagine today from early morning till now you have had a series of experiences you woke up and you heard the um, i mean you heard the alarm clock maybe that was an experience you woke up it felt like something to wake up from from a dream you maybe you brushed that was an experience you it felt like something and you tasted coffee or something and then you then you drove here driving down the freeway is an experience you are sitting here listening to my voice that's an experience you are hearing things you are seeing things you are thinking things you might say swami i'm not thinking of anything in particular blank good that's also an experience lack of thinking <laughs> now he points out this verse points out something extraordinarily simple but very profound here it is every experience is different from every other experience one second experiences come and go two experiences come and go and third most important each experience has two parts a changing part and an unchanging part what's the changing part and what's an unchanging part take up any experience there is an object which you experience for example right now if you're listening carefully you are hearing sound you're experiencing sound my voice that's the object of your experience and that changes i'm speaking so many words and sentences so different sounds are coming to your ears and there's a continuous series of experiences you are having and the object of experience changes but what what happens next sounds come into your ears and they produce thoughts in your mind they produce a thought in your mind thoughts in your mind those thoughts also change you see a clock clock is object of experience it produces a clock thought in your mind then you see a um, a person the person is an object of experience for you and it produces a person related thought in your mind so the object of experience changed the thought related to that object of experience changed but what did not change was in each each experience there is the background awareness to which the experience comes there is an unchanging awareness to which every experience comes in each in which every experience arises is experienced and it it dissipates or it subsides it's like the light in this room the light in this room suppose it's constant and there are people at before this there was nobody there was nobody the empty chairs the light shone upon the empty chairs now all the chairs are full there are people the same light is shining upon all the people at the end of the first session you will all walk out and the light will shine upon the empty chairs again the light is constant it did not change what changed the people coming in and going out that changed imagine your awareness 
the awareness, the sentience, the consciousness which we all have right now. We are all conscious, hopefully. Vedanta has a way of putting people to sleep. <laughs> we are all conscious right now. That consciousness is unchanging. And the objects of experience are changing and the thoughts produced by those objects of experience in our mind are changing. That's why one experience differs from another experience. One experience differs from another experience because the objects are different, one, and the thoughts and reactions they create in our mind are different, two, but in the background there is one constant unchanging awareness. Are you with me so far? Remember, three stages. What did he say? Yes. And then next session, we will, the next part of this session, we will talk about it. If you have questions, write it down or hold on to it, you will get a chance to ask. Now you might say, okay, what we have got so far is, our life is a series of experiences and each experience has two parts, a changing part and an unchanging part. Experiences differ from each other because the changing part differs. But the unchanging part, which is usually not noticed, that does not differ. That's constant. Like light lighting up a series of objects. The objects come and go. The objects are different from each other. The light is constant and not different. Now, as day fades into evening or night, we fall asleep and we perhaps we dream. We lose touch with the body. The mind is still active, but we are not aware of the body. The body is sleeping on the bed, but the mind generates dreams. And with the next verse comes. Tatha sopnetra vedyam tu na sthiram jagare sthiram tad bhedas tastayo samvid ekarupa na bhidyate Dreams come, generated by the mind. Here the sense organs are not operative, you are not contacting the external world, you are not hearing external sounds or you are not seeing sights or tasting external food, but the mind generates dreams based upon its past experiences. Now the point here is, an important point to understand, Vedanta is not interested in your dreams. Many people ask, so can dreams be true? I saw this in the dream, what does it mean? There are, you, you, can, you can go to a, a, a Jungian psychoanalyst who will tell you the meaning of your dreams. But Vedanta is not interested in, dream, in your dreams. You might say, that's unfriendly. <laughs> One Swami said to this person who came to him, said rather sharply, the person was telling about his sorrows, and the Swami said, I am not interested in your problems. That person was so shocked. I am interested in you. Do you see the difference between yourself and your dream? The contents of the dream, what you dream about, good or bad, they all appear, the verse says, they all appear to the same awareness which experienced your waking life. That awareness which is experiencing all this now, unchanging awareness, when you go to sleep and you dream, that same awareness continues undisturbed and it lights up the objects of your dream. Your dreams differ. Your waking life disappears and your dream life begin begins and every day maybe you have a different dream or a repetition of a same dream, whatever. Whatever you dream about, whomever you dream about, good or bad, whatever happens in the dream, what Vedanta is pointing out here is the awareness to which the dream appears is one and constant. It's the same awareness which experienced your waking life. It is the same awareness which is experiencing your dream life. Whether dreams are real or not, whether your waking life is a dream and as good as a dream, there are different schools of Vedanta. One school of Vedanta says, there is no difference between your waking and dreaming. Your waking is just a long dream. Hmm. It, this is what he is mentioning. Your dream is unstable, the waking life is more stable. Uh, in this life, here you are, if you, go, if you come to the Vedanta class and retreat and you fall asleep and you dream of being somewhere else on the beach maybe, and then you wake up, your car will still be there. Don't worry. The, the waking world is stable compared to the dream world. In your dream, if you are on your beach, on, in, the, in the beach and having a pizza, you cannot say, oh, it's time to wake up. Let me put the pizza in the, fr uh, in the fridge. I'll, next time I dream, I'll come and eat the pizza. 
because it's unstable, it won't be there anymore. But what Vedanta says is, we are not interested in the contents of your waking life, we are not interested in the contents of your dream experience, we are interested in the container, in the awareness, in which all these are happening. And that awareness continues undisturbed from waking to dreaming. This awareness, which continues undisturbed from waking to dreaming, when you go into deep sleep, because sleep is of two kinds, you dream and there's deep sleep, where you, you do not dream, have no experience, it's just blank. Doctors also know about that. And they say there is REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, which is associated with dreams. When people have those rapid eye movements and you wake them up, they will, repeat, they will report that they were dreaming. And there is sleep where there's no rapid eye movement under your closed eyelids. If you wake up people at that time, it's a cruel thing to do. If you wake them up, they report no dreams. It's a deep sleep. And the brain waves are apparently different also. So there are different levels of sleep. A light level of sleep is associated with dreams. A deeper level of sleep, no dreams, blankness. We say, I slept like a log. I didn't know anything. We say that. Deep sleep. Now somebody might ask a question. Here is something crucial. Somebody might ask a question. Swami, your thesis falls flat here. Because, all right, we have awareness in waking. We have awareness in dreaming. Definitely some kind of dream awareness is there because we experience dreams. But in deep sleep, there is no awareness. Deep sleep, it's blank. Everything's gone. So there is no continuity of consciousness. This idea you had of an unchanging consciousness, it, it disappears in deep sleep. Vedanta says no. The next verse is about this question. Is there consciousness in deep sleep or not? Next verse. Supto thetasya sau shupta tamo bodho bhavet smritihi sachava buddha vishaya ava buddham tattadatama In deep sleep, once you wake up from deep sleep, what do you say? There was nothing. I slept happily. I was um, uh, unaware of anything. But what Vedanta points out here is, yeah. settle down. What Vedanta points out here is, focus on this deep sleep. Vedanta claims that it's not an absence of experience. It's an experience of absence. Deep sleep, it's not unconsciousness, it's not no consciousness. It's consciousness without an object of consciousness. It's a container which is empty. It's like you go to carpentry, a station here, and then first you see an Amtrak train coming in. A lot of people getting down and getting up and the guard and then the announcements. A lot of happening, it's happening. It, it's like the waking life comes into your awareness. And then the train leaves. After some time, maybe a freight train comes in. No activity. Nobody's getting on, getting off. No announcements. It just passes. It stays there for a while and passes. Like your dream experience. Hazy. Not very important. Not the industrial grade reality which you see in waking state. It's a kind of virtual reality like a movie. It comes. And then the freight train leaves also. You're still there. What's there? No train. But to say that the platform is empty, there is no train, you must be there. You are the one who noted that there was an Amtrak, you are the one who noted there was a freight train, you are the one who noted there is nothing. Unless you note that there is no train, who will say that there is no train? Exactly like that in deep sleep. In the waking state, you noted, here is your waking state, I am sitting here in Santa Barbara and then the temple and listening to um, a talk on non-dual Vedanta. Fall asleep tonight, dream about something. There you are, dreaming about a walk on the beach in Santa, Santa Barbara or something, and the ocean and the mist and everything. A dream. Exactly like that, when you say deep sleep, nothing. Blank. You must have been there to see that, that blankness. Do you see where I'm going with this? That consciousness continues unabated. That consciousness is not thinking. In deep sleep, thinking also stops. You do not even think, 
I am in deep sleep, I am seeing nothing. No, if you do that, that's, that's the mind. You're not sleeping. Yeah. The mind has also shut down. So when we are talking about awareness here, consciousness here, we are not talking about the mind. The mind continuously changes. We are talking about a background awareness which does not change. That awareness in which the changing mind also shines. The thoughts arise and dissipate. One unchanging light. Like a bright blue sky full of sunlight where clouds of various hues come and go. Bright puffy white clouds, waking state. The early morning mist you saw, dream state. And at night, nothing. You don't see anything. But the sky is still there. In the same way, we are that unchanged consciousness because of which after waking up, we could say, I went to sleep, I had dreams and there was a time when I did not dream anything. It was blank. I was sort of deeply relaxed. I didn't know anything. It's because of that consciousness you're able to say that. Imagine, if there had been no consciousness in deep sleep, no awareness, then what would be our report upon waking up? We would say, I was awake, I went to sleep, I had dreams, now I'm awake again. That in-between period of no consciousness would never be reported. You'd never feel that I slept deeply without knowing anything. To put it briefly, deep sleep is not unconsciousness, according to Vedanta. Deep sleep is a state of where you have experience of absence, not absence of experience. You experience the absence of objects of experience. There's nothing to experience, that's deep sleep. There's something to experience, that's waking. There's something to experience, that's dreaming. The experiencing consciousness is one and unchanged. Next verse. Sabodho vishayad bhinno na bodhat swapna bodhavat evam sthanatra epyeka samviddadvad dinantare That consciousness in deep sleep which lights up the blankness of deep sleep. One mystic, a Christian mystic points out something very interesting. He says, I forget his name, he says this, the Blackness of deep space outside the earth's atmosphere, the blackness of deep space is actually full of light. Sunlight is streaming through space to the earth. How do you know? When a comet passes through it, you see a glorious display. At night, you see the comet's tail shining in the sunlight, which means what we call space between earth and sun looks black. It's black because there is nothing to reflect the sunlight which is continuously streaming from sun to earth. All that sunlight which lights up our world right now, what you can see right now, all that sunlight is coming through deep space, is, is streaming all the time. It looks black. Why does it look black? Because there is nothing to reflect the sunlight. If a satellite passes through it, you will see the satellite shining in light. If the moon passes through sunlight, you see the moon, the entire moonlight is basically borrowed sunlight. It's on credit. <laughs> so, it's, it's just borrowed light. In the same way, in deep sleep, he says, that blankness itself is the object of consciousness. Nothingness itself is the object of consciousness. Therefore, he concludes, in all the three states of our daily existence, waking, Dreaming, deep sleep, one point is that there is one unchanging awareness because of which through the mind and sense organs you experience the waking world. Because of which through the mind only you experience dreams. Because of which when the mind and sense organs have shut down in deep sleep you experience the blankness. That unchanging consciousness you are. Not this waking body and this little person here. The little person is in the mind. The body is physical right here. The body is in consciousness. You are not a body with awareness. You are awareness in which a body is experienced. You are unchanging awareness in which a changing body is experienced. The youth and the middle age and the old age and the decay and disease and eventual death of the body 
are all experienced in the same unchanging, unaging, undecaying, non-dying consciousness, which you are. All the changing dreams are experienced in that consciousness which you are. It's not the mind. The mind changes. Therefore, in all three states of our daily experience, there's one unchanging awareness. This is the central insight of the first session. And the next verse is very beautiful. The, f the f um, next verse is, Masabda yuga kalpeshu gatagameshu nekadha no deti nastametyeka samvid esha swayam prabha Beautiful verse which says, the self-effulgent consciousness which you are, which I am, this one neither rises nor sets. It's not a sun which rises and sets. Really speaking, the sun, this sun also does not rise and set. It's an illusion created by the, the rotation of the earth. But it's a sun which neither rises nor sets. What are we talking about? We're talking about you, this consciousness. Rises or sets means it's neither created nor destroyed. This consciousness is neither created nor destroyed. The body is born and the body dies. Thoughts are created, thoughts appear and thoughts disappear. It is witnessed by the same unchanging consciousness. Month, he says here, very beautiful verse, months pass, years pass, lifetimes pass. A body dies, we get other bodies. This consciousness neither emerges nor disappears. He says, eons pass, universes are created and destroyed. You know, the Hindu idea of the universes is not that it was created once and will be destroyed once forever. It's, this, it's cyclic. There is creation, existence, destruction, again creation, existence and destruction, and so on in, in cyclical order. A bit like nowadays they are talking about um, the big crunch and the big bang. Yeah. So I, in New York, where I am right now, the Met is very close, the, the Metropolitan Museum, and they have a very nice planetarium. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so he narrates the whole thing. And then he talks about how, the, how modern cosmology is coming around to this point of view that there are universes which are created in a big bang, which go through their entire life cycle and die in a, either a heat death or a big crunch. And again, a new universe is generated. Universes cycle through. You, the consciousness, you neither emerge nor, nor are you destroyed. You are the witness to this whole game. This consciousness, one and self-effulgent, you are. First, first part of the first session is over. To sum up, the outline is this. Our life is a series of experiences. You are with me on this? Good, bad, desired for, anxious about, not desired for. Lot of experiences, a series of experiences. These experiences are all different from each other. Having a cup of tea and having a cup of coffee, they're different experiences. They're different from each other. And the thoughts we have about these exp experiences in our mind, they're also different. They come and go. But the awareness in which these experiences come is unchanging, constant, immortal. That awareness, think of it as an unchanging light, is what you truly are. You say, no, Swami, I'm this body. But are you an awareness and are you experiencing a body? You say, yes. If the body disappears from your awareness, as it does every night when you go to sleep, are you there or not? If you are not there, then who dreamt? So I was there. Were you aware of your body on the bed? No. I was aware of doing something else on the beach in Santa Barbara or somewhere else. Not on the bed. I was not uh, aware of my body sleeping on the bed. Therefore, your awareness continues without awareness of the body. It's proved. It's, uh, there's no doubt about it. And even the mind, when the mind shuts down in deep sleep, even there, if you understood that bit about deep sleep, then in, we have to admit that in some sense, awareness itself, minus any object of awareness, continues. Therefore, awareness is continuous. There should be questions. So the first part, 
is over. This is the pointing to the pure consciousness which you are. Think about it. When you say you are pure consciousness, it sounds cool, but whatever does it mean? Now you know what it means. It's pointing to something very real within you, within us, all the time present. It's because of that awareness that we have this experience of life. Our problem is we have identified that awareness which we, which we are and we have put on top of it the mind and the body. And forgetting that unchanging awareness, we identify ourselves with the mind and the body. I'm a man. I'm a woman. I'm happy. I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy trying to be happy. <laughs> I'm overweight trying to lose weight. What does this say? No, 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 you're not. Consciousness is not overweight. <laughs> Consciousness does not need to lose weight. Consciousness is not even happy. Happiness is a thought in the mind. Anything that comes and goes, comes and goes in your awareness. Happiness is a thought in the mind. Anxiety is a thought in the mind. Fear is a thought in the mind. These are experiences. These are the contents of your experience. You are not the contents of your experience. You are the light shining upon the contents of your experience. You are not this body. This body appears in you, the awareness. You're not even the person. Where is the person? The person is in the mind. Proof. When you go to deep sleep, the person disappears. Think about it. We are more than a hundred people here. We are all so different from each other. There are men and there are women. There are young people. There are old people. Young and old, body. Man and woman, body. The person Different kinds of people, different occupations, different talents, different life histories. But when we all go into deep sleep, when we go into deep sleep, even our, our dreams are different, but when we go into deep sleep, isn't our experience, all of us, we have exactly the same experience in deep sleep. Proving that the differences between us are the differences of body and of personality of personal history. And they are all in the body, they are all in the mind, not in the background pure awareness which we all are. In that pure awareness, we are also all one. We are not different pure awarenesses. It's one pure awareness shining through many bodies and minds. At the deepest possible level, we are all immortal and we are all one reality, one consciousness. Let's have some discussion now. We are entering into the second phase of the first session. Just raise your hand. Are you able to hear my voice? Yes. Don't worry about not can seeing me. Can you see my hand? Yes, I can see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll work backwards from there. The people who are raising their hands, just give it to an, yes. First of all, nice to see you again, Swami. Nice um, to be here, yes. Always uh, missed you. Um, so for energy and spirit at the same time, I guess that's some of the message you're trying to say. My problem, well not a problem, is I want these experiences because I'm human, because I want to grow. So are we just supposed to have that experience, acknowledge it, and just, just let it go? Right. First of all, we must be aware that we are not our experiences. If we were our experiences, the accumulation of our experiences, you know, all the selfies that we have taken and all the places we have visited, the photos jamming our hard disks which we never look at again. <laughs> uh, what are we doing? I am a sum total of all the places I've been to, the people I've met, the food I've eaten. I think I'm my experiences. No, you are not. You are far more than your experiences. Those experiences are like clouds flo floating through a shining blue sky. You are not the clouds. You are the shining blue sky. Let the experiences come and go. You enjoy the experiences as, a, as the witness of all of them. Don't get attached to them. Don't identify with them that I am these experiences. If you identify with them, what will happen is I want to collect nice experiences, pleasant experiences, people I like, the food I like, the places I like, the jobs I like, and I'd hate these other experiences, other people and the food and jobs. And life becomes a perpetual struggle, trying to replace one set of experiences with another set of experiences. It's like the sky saying, I like this cloud, I don't like that cloud. <laughs> the sky has nothing to do with the clouds. It provides space for the... The clouds depend on the sky. Without the sky, no clouds are possible. Can you see how all the experiences that you have had, they depend on you, the awareness, 
Without you, the one who experiences, no experience. But you do not depend on the experiences. They, these experiences which float through you, I'll tell you something, it may be shocking. You ask, I, we grow through that, you know. They add nothing to you, they detract nothing from you. The worst of experiences can detract nothing from you. I'm telling you this with all conviction. You, the unchanging consciousness, will remain ever that. I had a very moving experience, another experience. <laughs> People try to call me and talk with me, but it's difficult to talk with everybody. So somebody called and said that uh, I wish to speak with you and over Skype. So I put her off. I said, okay, later. And then she wrote, saying that I have no time, I am dying. So I said, of course, we can speak. And uh, she was in a hospice, in a place, I will not tell the name because it's because of privacy. This person, this lady was dying of cancer. And we spoke a few times. Um, I don't know, I, she reached out to me for help. I think I was the one who was helped. She's been pursuing Buddhism and Vedanta most of her life. And the calmness and the light and the dignity with which she faced what she was going through. Never once complained about pain and nausea and suffering. Her caregiver told me. And she just asked a few questions about Vedanta, about Buddhism, about the Guru. I still remember. She's saying on Skype. Oh, Sw she's on the bed. You know, she's saying, Oh Swami, I'm dying. I don't know if I have a few hours left maybe. I said, you are not dying. You are immortal. And I can never forget the the way her face lit up and said, yes, I am immortal. I look forward to it. You're so relaxed about it. It's another experience. I'm not the body. I'm not even that, li that little person who is facing death. Yes, so n even the worst of experiences, dying of cancer, you can think of it as a terrible experience, it detracts nothing from the pure awareness which you are in the background. It's terrible for the person. If you are rooted in the person, I am this person, oh my God, I'm dying of cancer. Yeah. Can I not please live, live a few more days? In the Bible it is said, who by his own will can add even an instant, even a moment to his life? We are like the grass of the fields, you know, the flowers of the fields here today and dead tomorrow. You cannot. The little person is an experience who will pass away. But you, the immortal consciousness in the background, you are not touched by it. I'll say something horrible. You can even enjoy it. Yeah. The saints do. There are so many examples of saints who, who see the joy in insult and deprivation and disease. You can think, well, that's crazy. But no, it's not. Because underneath it all, behind it all, they see the same background radiation, the, the same one consciousness everywhere. All right, question. Somebody close to you? Yes. There's the person there. Hi, Swamiji. Nice to see you once again. Uh, so I'm finding a uh, difficult time to understand the deep state, uh, I mean, deep sleep state. So I understand waking and uh, dreaming uh, you experience. But like in deep sleep, you are experiencing the absence. That is difficult because so when I wake woke up, then I infer that, OK, five hours or eight hours pass away. So that, so that means I infer I was in deep sleep. But All right. Let me stop you right there. Follow what he said. It's, it's a good question. When we wake up, do we look at, look at the clock and say, OK, eight hours. Three of those hours I dreamt. So that re re leaves five hours, which are blank. So those five hours, I must have slept. Do we do that or do we wake up and say, I had dreams and I have periods of no dream? Uh, do you follow? The question he's asking is, when we wake up, do we actually remember our deep sleep or we just remember our dreams and we, then we look at the clock and we infer that, okay, I had a period of dreams and the rest of it must have been deep sleep. But we don't infer actually. Look at your own lived experience. Do you look at the clock and calculate? No. Do you not feel that there was a blank, nothingness, when you wake up? Why when you wake up? Because then the mind starts functioning and looking back upon what happened just now. Do you see my point? Look at it from another way. Look at it another way. Remember, these questions are useful for everybody. 
Here is your waking world, which you can see, which you can hear, which you can smell and touch and taste, right? And inside you there is an internal world, where you think, where you remember, where you feel good or bad, where you desire, where you are frustrated, where you are angry, where you are peaceful. That's the internal private mental world, right? Now imagine emptying yourself of everything. No physical world, you cannot see. You cannot hear, you cannot smell, touch, nothing. No senses functioning. Thoughts cease. No feelings, no sensations, no ideas, no memories, no dreams. Not even I. Blank. Zero. Emptied of everything. Now my question is, are you gone? Try to follow this carefully. Uh, each of these are actually pointers to the reality that you are. Are you gone? Some will say yes. They are identifying with the mind. Something that has been emptied out. You throw something out of the container. Empty the container. If you identify yourself with something that was in the container, you will say I am gone. But if you identify yourself with the container, you will say everything is gone, but I am the empty container. I am the awareness. I am the field of light where there is nothing to shine upon. I remember, I'll give you one more example. Do you know these PowerPoint presentations? You have a projector up on the ceiling which throws a beam of light and the pictures on a screen and where you point out stuff on the PowerPoint. The projector actually throws a powerful beam of light. Right? I was talking about this in a seminar in, um, in India, in a place called Nalanda, which is one of the oldest universities of the world. Uh, the ruins are still there. The, the university was there from 580 to uh, 1280, 800 years. To give you a perspective, the oldest college in Oxford is Balliol College, which started in 1280. So that's when Nalanda was, was coming to an end, it was destroyed. So there, the, there are new universities now. I was not giving a talk in the ruins. <laughs> Uh, the ruins are archaeologically preserved. So, in the talk, I wanted to illustrate this, this kind of question had come. So suddenly I had a, uh, an idea. I said, look, this space seems to be blank, nothing, dark. But I knew that the beam of light was passing through there to, for the PowerPoint. So when I thrust my hand here, suddenly see the whole hand lit up with white light. Because the light is shining right through here. I could see it. But the people in the audience couldn't see it. When I thrust my hand into the beam of light, you could see my hand shining in that light. When I remove my hand, this just looks like empty space. You can't see the light here. When I put my hand in the light, you can see the, not only my hand, but you can see the light reflected from my hand. My question is, when I remove my hand, is the light here gone? No. I wish I could show it to you. It's so vivid. It's, it's startling. So much light. So bright, and yet seems to be nothing there. It seems to be nothing because there's nothing for the light to be reflected from. Similarly, in deep sleep, there is no thought, no dream, no sensation, nothing for consciousness to, to illumine. That's why it looks like that. There are a lot of discussions on this. Some philosophers actually say what you are saying. That we infer, isn't it that we infer when we wake up? Vedanta says, look at your experience. You don't infer. You actually report not experiencing anything, blankness. All right, question. Um, we can come up here. Oh, okay, there. Yes. Um, Swami, I find and I would like to know, is it my mind or this mind or is it like this wanting to know what then is the purpose or does this that we, the container, does it have an agenda, for lack of a better question? You know what I'm asking? Like yes. The distinction, or how do we... Think about it. What agenda do you have in deep sleep? None. None. It, what's the point? Is that just me? The point is you yourself. If there is a point at all, it is that pure consciousness. In fact, the point of all of this is to lead you back to the absolute that you are. The point of all of this, this game of life, is to take you back to the reality that you are. I can't put it any better than Alan Watts, who was a, a very funny philosopher, very uh, British. He was into Zen and Buddhism and Vedanta. 
uh, and uh, he loved Advaita Vedanta. He used to say, if religion, as well, he was very mischievous also. He was in San Francisco in the Bay Area in the 60s. So he's, uh, he used to say, if religion is the opium of the masses, then I must say that the Hindus have the inside dope. What is the inside dope in the context of your question? What's the point of it all if you ask? He put it so beautifully. He says, when people ask me such a question, I tell them a little story for children. And I find that children understand it much faster than our adults do. Children are satisfied with this story. If they ask, what is all this? The story goes like this. God only existed from eternity to eternity. There's only one reality. Again, you can see what he means now in Vedanta. We are, we are talking about that reality right now. But he puts it in simple terms. God only existed from eternity to eternity. Now, God, had a, God was lonely. Mm. Got lonely. I mean, all by himself, a lonesome self. So God decided to play hide and seek. Just to pass the time. But then that's a big problem. Whom will God play hide and seek with? There's nobody else. There's really nobody else. And poor God, whom would he play with? Then God hit upon a plan. What's the plan? God pretended to be not God. God, in, in order to play hide and seek, pretended to be not God. God pretended to be you and him and her and me and everybody else. God pretending to be not God. But then, because it's God and he's awfully good at everything he does, he pretended so well, he forgot that he was God. <laughs> and the game of life started. From eternity to eternity, spinning around in the world, you know, individual beings and plants and animals and men and women and children and good and bad and evil and striving. All of it is God seeking to find himself again. That's the story. That's all of it. <laughs> Question. All right, I'll come here. All right. Uh, namaste. Uh, my question is uh, that we do understand that it's the unchanged consciousness through which we experience <sighs> everything. But how do I remind myself of that constantly? Because we are so much attached. Good. I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that's the third part of today's session. <laughs> you see how beautifully we, we uh, segue into that. Because once you start becoming aware of what we are talking about, immediately your question will be, how do I remain in that? That's cool. That's great. How do I remain in that? The answer to that is, first of all, you don't have to do anything at all. Whether you attend one more Vedanta talk or not, you are always that. You are helplessly that. You cannot be anything else. It's like asking, you know, what you are asking, how do I remain as that pure consciousness? How do I remind myself that I am that pure consciousness? It's like the waves in the ocean asking, wow, there is something called water. How do I become water? <laughs> mm. It's exactly that. You are, not water, pure consciousness. And you cannot be anything else. But I understand what you are saying. We tend to keep getting mixed up uh -huh. with the body, mind and the little person. And it's not all that easy. The way I am pointing out seems to be very direct, very easy. When you read Advaita, that's the problem. It, if Once you begin to get it, there cannot be anything simpler than this. It's the sim one simple truth of existence. Swami Vivekananda called it the open secret. There's a lecture, the open secret. It's right here staring at us in the face. We don't see it. But how do I abide in that? We'll come to techniques for that. There's a question here. Please come here. Yes. Swami, what is the difference between what neuroscientists call core consciousness? Hmm which is a part they can identify in the brain yes. that governs a lot of what we do, but we can't be aware of it. For example, our organs are always digesting and yes. taking care of things. Maybe could, could the awareness that when we wake up and we know that we haven't been even dreaming, 
could that come from that part of the brain called core consciousness? Right. What is the difference? Right now is an exciting time for consciousness studies. About 25 years ago, no serious scientist would touch consciousness studies. But now it's a booming field. The universities have departments. Um, our neighbor in, in Manhattan, the NYU, has a whole, whole department called Mind, Brain and Consciousness Unit. And this idea, the, the problem of consciousness is, one side of it is we understand there must be some link with this thing we call the brain and nervous system. There must be some link. Something is functioning through that. But other side is what you are experiencing and what I'm experiencing right now. Right now, you are not experiencing neurons firing. You're seeing colors, you're hearing sound, you're thinking thoughts. This is consciousness for you and for me. But for a scientist who studies this from outside, he has no access to it. What he has or she has access to is the brain, other nerves, other neurons, which they can scan with fMRI scans and many other things. Now, how do the two come together? You see the two sides of it? This table or this book has only one dimension, the physical dimension. But you have two dimensions. There's an external public dimension, which is the physical dimension. And there's an internal dimension, your own inner life of thoughts, emotions, desires, your lived experience. That is not directly accessible to any machine whatsoever. That's what we call the conscious life within. So how do the two come together? There's David Chalmers, who is a philosopher, and who coined the term the hard problem of consciousness. If you Google consciousness studies, you'll in invariably come across the hard problem of consciousness. How do you explain the brain generating a first-person subjective experience? So that's what she's asking. How do, you, how do you connect the two? Where is in the brain, the activities of the brain, are they generating consciousness? Vedanta says no. Vedanta says consciousness is fundamental. It functions through the mind and the mind functions through the brain. Even now, in modern consciousness studies, they are unable to separate mind and consciousness. And yet, in Vedanta right now, do you see that you are able to separate mind and consciousness? What is mind? I can't resist telling you this little joke. In all philosophy departments, they start off with this little joke. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> okay, I had to just get it out of the way. That's so cliched, yes. That is so cliched. But that's the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, we'll take one more question. We are running out of time for the meditation. Yeah. For the record. Okay, that's all right. You forgot my hand. Yes, we have a question here. Um, my question is, what is your hand that's sticking in the light? Hmm. According to Sankhya, we have the gunas and maya and all the play and the two realities and everything, but what is it according to Advaita Vedanta? Good. I'll just repeat the question for you. The hand sticking in the light. The world and your body and mind appearing in the awareness, the light which you are. It's the hand sticking in the light. This world is shining in your awareness. Now the question is, what is this world? Is it real? Is it something apart from the light? Clearly, there's light there and I put my hand there. My hand and the light are two different things. The light shines upon my hand. The hand is not the light. The light is not the hand. The light is not produced by the hand. It's different. That's the position of Sankhya philosophy. They say there are two realities. There's a material reality of time, space, matter, energy called nature, Prakriti. And there is consciousness, separate from this material reality. Two realities. Advaita Vedanta says there are not two realities, but one reality. I'll answer it precisely and let it leave it at that. I'm glad you asked, because this is a seminar on non-dualism. If somebody who had been following this acutely would immediately sense, Swami, you're speaking about duality, consciousness and everything else. That's what you're speaking about. Consciousness and everything else. Advaita says no. Everything that appears in consciousness is nothing but the same consciousness with name and form. This will become more clear in the third session when the pointer, the insight will be about existence. But in Advaita Vedanta, everything that you experience in your awareness is actually that awareness itself 
coming in front of you with different names and forms. That's called Maya. We'll just leave it at that. If it is the awareness coming in front of you with different names and forms and giving you an experience of the world, if it is God who has hidden himself as not God, so whatever God experiences, which looks like not God, looks like Mr. X or Mrs. Y, but is actually God himself. So it looks no dual, it's actually non-dual. Think of the story of God pretending to be not God. Is it dualism or is it non-dualism? Think about it. It looks dual because God is playing hide and seek with himself. There are different people, different plants, animals, worlds. But if it's all God pretending to be not God, pretending to be men and women and plants and animals in the world, in that case, really what is there? Only God is there. Only the ultimate is there. So it's really a non-dual. Non-dual appearing as duality is what uh, Advaita sees our life as. All right. We'll stop here. And we go back to that question. How do I abide in this? We're going into the third part of the first session. There are different meditations. We do one meditation. The first part of all meditations will be a relaxation. Nothing to do with non-duality. Just relax the body and breathe and guide you. <coughs> or you sit and breathe. The real meditation will be what we studied just now. I remember doing this in one place, in some other place. And after the meditation I asked for comments and one person raised his hand and said, Swami, you said breathe deeply and evenly and after that I didn't understand anything else. I, I followed you up to that point. <laughs> you sit relaxed and breathe evenly. That's, I understand that. After that pure consciousness, abiding, I don't get it at all. No, that second part is the real meditation which is going to come. Sit straight but not rigid. Whichever, whatever is comfortable. You can tuck your legs up on the chair, you can put them on the floor. Don't stoop or don't slouch. If you like, you can put your hands on your lap. When you are ready, you can close your eyes. Breathing normally. Breathing in. listening to my voice. Many of you have already got what I was talking about. So you really don't have to follow my instructions. You can just abide in the background awareness. Just abide there. Or if you like, you can follow my instructions. Breathing normally, relax the body. left hand relaxed, wherever it is. Just think of it and think of it being relaxed. Left hand relaxed. Left arm relaxed. Left shoulder relaxed. Right hand relaxed. Right arm Relaxed. Right shoulder. Relaxed. Left foot. Relaxed. Left leg. Relaxed. Right foot. Relaxed. Right leg, relax. Waist, relax. Waist to neck, upper body, relax. Sitting straight, breathing normally. Relax the neck. Back of the head, top of the head, 
forehead, eyes, and eyes. Face. Listen to the sounds you can hear. My voice, other sounds. <coughs> Note that the sounds appear to you the awareness. The sounds arising in awareness disappear. Back into awareness. Focus first of all on the sound, note the sound, presence of the sound, any sound. And from there, go back to the awareness. Note that it appears in awareness. Anything that it disturbs you, a sound, a sensation in the body, don't be disturbed. Just use it, just note that the sensation appears in me, the unchanged consciousness. discomfort in the body or unease in the mind just note that that feeling appears in me the unchanging consciousness the sensations come and fade I remain Sounds arise and disappear. I, the awareness, remain. And thus do I abide. Thus my days and nights wheel before me in my consciousness. In I, the light of consciousness, Days and nights pass. The body changes and ages. The mind thinks so many things and feels so many things, remembers and forgets. I am the unchanging light of awareness. Old age and disease do not touch me. They are objects of experience in the body. <coughs> Depression and misery do not touch me. They are objects arising in the in a shining blue sky. They soon fade away.
every sound, every sensation brings back, reminds me of the light that I am. seated in, in the temple, you're on a chair, there are people around you, breathing normally, I will chant Om three times, on the third time, open your eyes and look down at your hands on your lap, or just look down, three times over. Oh. Alright folks, it's time to relax, you can get out, stretch, 